And one theme that came across in all three presentations is this issue of um, risk and resilience. It wasn't quite clear to me uh, what are the current capabilities of the ACT system models to um, either represent or mimic the, the impact of shocks to the system, be it shocks due to the extremes, be it shocks due to the market-related issues, if we are serious about really going towards providing information for building a more resilient agriculture system of the future. Somehow we have to account for these shocks. Are the models up to the challenge of accepting and representing those shocks? For example, in your uh, description of the challenges, I saw that you were talking about the economic and you know, weather climate, but in reality, the shocks are really a combination of those two, you know, the feedback mechanisms between the two. Um, you know, where are we with that science and how far do we need to go in order to be able to do that kind of analysis? John, you want to start? Um, sure. Uh, and <clears throat> some of the other economists in the room might want to speak to this for the economics part. But uh, the, the kinds of models I was uh, describing there are not very well suited. They're equilibrium models. They're typically used to do, a, you know, what we would call a comparative static experiment, and so they're they're not looking at the disequilibrium dynamics of a shock like the 2008 to 2012 so-called food crisis episode, if that's what you're referring to, uh, or or to the you know the extreme event, the the the, the short run disequilibri disequilibrium effects of extreme events. Um, they're really looking at long term equilibrium. You know, they, they talk about subjecting their models to shocks, but don't be confused by the terminology there, yeah, because they're not these short-run disequilibrium shocks. But, Dominique, would you like to comment, or? Well, I want to comment on that and, and something else uh, that in your talk. I mean, in my view, if you have horses for courses when you're thinking about models, and so you just, you know, you, you develop your models to answer specific questions, and you don't mm -hmm. develop a model that's going to answer all the questions. Right. So the difference, for example, between the regional and the global models isn't so much in how they're structured, because we're using the same economic theory, right? We have cost-minimizing producers and welfare-maximizing consumers and things like that. It's just we're answering different questions. So in your case, I think you're looking at heterogeneity, which is not something that the global models are typically interested in. You know, we have one consumer per country or per region. And so we're, we're getting, a, but we're, we're asking a different question and getting, you know, hopefully a consistent answer. And that goes, you know, goes to the shots as well. I mean, we can develop models where, where uh, uh, the, the shots, um, where you can adjust to, you know, the kind of shock that, that we're talking about here. Um, it depends a little bit on the time scales as well. A lot of our models are five-year time scale or decadal time scale. So normally those shocks just, you know, just don't have persistent impacts. Mm -hmm. So these models aren't intended to, to assess kind of short-term cyclical events, if you want. Let, let me comment on that and get Sherman, and then we need to go to uh, the crop and livestock models. But I took a course in uh, North Carolina State University called Non-Equilibrium Thermodynamics. And I hear all this about the equilibrium models, but are there, is there an equivalent theory or some models that deal with non-equilibrium over space and time sure. uh, in economics? Yeah. And maybe that's a uh, term that we talk about that. Yeah, on uh, uh, both those comments, the notion of equilibrium here is, is one, it's very simple, market's clear. But in fact, that, that, Lloyd's, that Lloyd's report you cited they asked IFPRI to run the impact model with their scenario, which we did. At Molly John's was the intermediary between that. And there the question is, this notion that gets, gets back to John's point is, we ran that model, they gave us the shock, so we hammered maize yields and whatever, and we, we ran about three or four different scenarios, under two potential reaction assumptions. One, you can't do anything about the cropping pattern. You're stuck. You planted it, 
If we didn't get it, what happens, what happens to markets under that environment? And then we asked the question, okay, now, now let's see what happens if you allow planting to adjust to that with some unknown time scale. I mean, you know, we just assumed that. You know, it smooths it all out, but they're descriptive. They didn't take the actual numbers in that document. They kind of added it to it themselves, but we're cited in it. Uh, and yes, the answer is, yeah, we can analyze that kind of thing. It's a very important issue. The notion of equilibrium is how much can adjust. We made an assumption that says you can't change the channel. You, you don't get to change your mind about the cropping pattern. <laughs> That's one equilibrium. The other is, in our long-run scenarios, we assume everything adjusts. So the notion of equilibrium is very important if you're going to start sorting out what happens in a, a shock scenario. Well, just one other quick response to your question, Jim. So there are people who study commodity markets, storage, how you know, stocks, dynamics. The, and the dynamics of prices for individual commodities. But I don't think there are any models like that that do, you know, the whole system of commodities in an interrelated way. So that does seem like a challenge then because a but lot of the things that we exactly need to, to do. But your model doesn't have storage we, in it, does it? What? Your model doesn't have storage in it, does it? No, we carefully did not allow because we want to get an extreme case for, for them. Yeah. A, a, a inventory a response in both directions. We wanted to get the outer bounds of, of what that shock would do. Let me let me turn to Jean Francois and see about shocks and, and all of the biophysical model. Yes, well, so in theory, at least the biophysical models uh, can handle shocks. Um, it's uh, there are some limitations, however, and uh, uh, for instance, uh, how would you? Uh, link uh, what happens with the water resources would be uh, clearly very important and uh, possibly not well covered currently. Um, how would you uh, then think uh, of the, uh, as we had in this large example, uh, uh, the health issues for plant and animal is also something which is uh, currently not well uh, coupled to our uh, models. It's another type of shock. And I, I'm, I, I do well understand what was mentioned about the possible responses of the farmers. And I think that's clearly extremely important. And uh, I'm not sure that our model settings uh, would uh, help you very much in designing what would be uh, the responses of farmers to such shocks. Mm -hmm. So this would be another area where we need to investigate more. I see, uh, Hugo, you were interested in um, maybe answering something, because I know Yaza is, uh, is uh, currently developing an annual version of the integrated model uh, to answer with the shocks. But I, your comment was maybe something else. I just else. wanted to add a few points on the general uh, detection here. Because that's quite clear that using those, those uh, partial or general equilibrium in that framework, that's kind of new, new adventure. Because the first thing is that um, that requires reparameterizing the models because usually the parameters that we use are quite long term. Then that's a question of time frame because of course so what we're doing indeed at the moment if we start to develop a stochastic version of our model we would introduce risk behavior uh, in the model directly and also taking into account volatility that you see in the yield. But for the moment we are just doing this trying to bring uh, the time step to one year. But it's not even sufficient probably. Because if you think about how many seasons you have and what determines the price impact on the market, you have probably to go even finer in terms of time scale. And we know that well. In the way also we process um, the climate model output, because currently we process all this data, uh, we aggregate also a bit over time to have average impacts, and we will need in fact to maybe uh, rethink the design of those scenarios in order to bring also the volatility component through the modeling chain. But it's just to say that it's something that is not impossible, but it's a very, very uh, big challenge in terms of modeling. We are trying to go into that direction currently. We are at the very beginning. Uh, but it's definitely something that will require many years of, of effort. Well, one, one thing I've seen uh, students in, in economics have taken like the farming scale model and looked at it on a dynamic basis, on a monthly basis. For example, we had some students at the University of Florida that were there. But I wanted to uh, say Frank had his hand up next to maybe deal with biophysical uh, additions to what uh, Jean Francois. Yes, it comes from this presentation, but I think it's broader. Uh, Jean Francois made two comments. One was uh, referring to technology, endogenizing technology. And you also said we are not able to model these transformative processes. Where, where do you see this modeled? Or where should this be modeled? If we distinguish between the biophysical part and the economic models? 
I find it difficult to see how we can, as biophysical modelers, endogenize technological development in our models. Yeah, I try to, to answer to this. <clears throat> I think it's, it's obviously challenging. <coughs> Uh, maybe one way to look at it would be uh, to take examples on what is currently happening in modeling uh, mitigation. Mm -hmm. So modeling mitigation is that you have a broad range of technologies with different costs associated and you do have some of the models adopting uh, with some constraints on the maximum adoption level technologies depending on the costs and it is uh, they are quite helpful uh, with help of the of a carbon price because there's a carbon price plays a role of uh, uh, telling whether or not your technology can be adopted or not. So if we were to think better, and that's still something missing to me, I, I, I never, I've been asking this in a project to colleagues in economy, but they, they could not come with something. Uh, I was asking, can you create something which would be an adaptation uh, cost curve? You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. You have a panel of technologies in adaptations, they have different costs, at which stage because of the damage in your production, mm -hmm. uh, would you adopt those mm -hmm. technologies? Mm -hmm. And I think this would be extremely helpful in understanding where we can go with adaptation and even transformation. Uh, but but that's, that stresses the need for integrating these. Yeah. Yes, yes, I agree. I, I would. Yeah. Uh, when when I was saying endogenizing, is that uh, the way it is set in some of the uh, integrated models? Uh, yeah. What I understand, at least, is that it is really from very broad functions about economic development, which are very far away from what farmers may actually do. Uh, so uh, I suspect there is a lot of margin of uh, progress there. Uh, I thank Ken, and then uh, I want to ask uh, Adam a question. Okay. Ken, go ahead. Um, th back to the extreme event, if I would assume mostly the extreme event would be uh, severe drought, I mean a, a long term, possibly flood. But I would think that you would want models, we would hope that the models handle the drought effects well, but one is the, the parameterization from the standpoint of the soils is a big uncertainty. The other is that they probably should be run with sequence continuation because that water deficit carries over for the next year, or if you had flood, you have almost the opposite kind of situation. And Maybe the last point would be that if it's severe enough, then the farmers sell off their cattle if they're grazing regions, so you create a whole other set of dynamics. Yeah, indeed, yes. Yes. Right, right. Pretty agree with you. Yeah, yeah and, and I wanted to ask Adam, I mean, talking about these shocks and economics yes. and all, uh, nutrition seems to have been left out of most of these assessments in, in the past. And what do you see needs to be done, you know, based on what you're you mentioned uh, four different perspectives, the uh, nutrition perspective, mm -hmm. economic, cultural, and environment. Well, we have not really dealt with the issue of shock. We've modeled um, actually um, potential impact on diet cost and diet quality of replacing something with something else, which is kind of equivalent of shock. Like, for example, if all the meat were to go out of the diet, it's a kind of cultural shock. What would it do to greenhouse gas emissions, water content, and so on? So we actually do some modeling of diets, um, but some of the data that we need are really not there for every country that we work in. They're really very limited. For example, no, I work with data on cost for the United States, France, and now Mexico, and data on cost are generally not available. The data on greenhouse gas emissions have been available for France, but they are not available at this time for the US. So actually it's very difficult to be able to populate this framework of the four domains and the metrics that I've mentioned because data are not really available for every country under the same circumstances. Mm -hmm. You pick up and do whatever you can with what you've got. And it also seems that the nutrition aspects need to be integrated in with the, the crop and the livestock The nutrition aspects have completely be integrated. I think that we're talking about know. climate smart agriculture. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the nutrition sensitive agriculture so that we don't model producing extra calories, that some people will argue we don't actually need what we need is nutrients and a better nutrient to calorie ratio. So nutrition sensitive agriculture um, is I think is kind of my theme here. Yeah, Jess had maybe a comment. Yeah, on I just this wanted topic. to add on to what Adam was saying. I also think it depends on the kind of shock you're talking about. We're talking about an extreme event. 
like the you know the Horn of Africa drought, you you want to look at a totally different set of indicators. You're looking at children who are wasted, child mortality, those kind of indicators to trigger an early action sort of system. I think if you're looking at price shocks and you're looking more at some of these diet indicators, food access indicators. So I think it depends on the shock that you're talking about. Some are going to require faster action. Different measures and different yeah. metrics. For example, yeah. for the long term, you'd be looking at stunting, undernutrition, child mortality, and so on. Well, it seems like you know we haven't talked a lot about the data requirements yet, yeah, but, yeah. but this brings in a whole new a dimension for the data requirements for dealing with these. Yes, yes, uh, describing the event. Yeah, Christoph was next and then Cynthia. Yeah. Yeah, I also have a question on the nutrition aspect, which is probably the one I understand least of the three presenters. <laughs> um, and I have a whole range of questions I try to focus yep. to understand what the challenge uh, in general is and what the challenge to maybe crop models and economic models is. So first of all, um, we are doing pretty badly by basically ignoring it, and Jerry Nelson did not get very on pointing on that, uh, that we are missing that point. He called that the lamppost problem. Um, but you, you said that in cities you worry about, worry about that um, the people get processed food which is enriched in calories and cheap sugar, and therefore it's obesity uh, looming. But if you talk about processed food, you could fix basically all the nutrition issues anyway because you could just add all the nutrients that are needed. So that probably boils down then to a cost question, I guess, but I, I don't okay, really know. Okay, let's rephrase some of those issues. One, people select food based on many factors, but economics is going to be one of the major ones. Essentially, people eat the foods they can afford. So cost is going to be driving things, in addition to cultural preferences, availability, and nutritional concerns may come later. Now, in places where people are away from means of production, means not on the farm when they raise their own food, they're in a city, they depend on third parties to feed them. And here you have reliance on processed foods, which are not by definition bad because they can be affordable, fortified, and nutrient-rich, and then you rely on the retail, which is now transforming the developed countries. So in India, you had a very, for example, local retail system. Now you have Carrefour. So everything is being transformed. So for modelers, going back to the modelers, the point is that the parameters are not constant in time and space. They're constantly evolving. Things are changing. Behaviors are changing. The need for the crops through modeling will be changing, all of those things need to be taken into account. So for example, what we see right now is when it comes to the obesity epidemic, it is affecting the poor in rich countries and the rich in poor countries, but it's increasingly hitting urban agglomerations in middle to lower income countries. So Sao Paulo, Rio, Mexico City will have increasing numbers of people who are overweight and obese, malnourished in a way, who are poor. So all of those things you need to take into account, the nutritional status, the socioeconomic status, the economics, the nutrient density of foods, the energy density, and then the means of supply. Because increasingly, we're going away from farms which produce food for the household, much more into urban agglomeration with third parties coming to play. And this is why the food industry and the retail industry must be taken into consideration and actually become partners. Fewer people are living on farms where you can really look at the farm type household metrics that is not going to be the future. Okay, but to come back to the question, yep. uh, what the crop models need to do, because you said you're not interested in what CO2 does on zinc content ah. by 2050. But I thought, well, if you talk about well, uh, not just quantities, but also the quality, like protein content maybe, zinc would be really, mm -hmm. really oh, no, a step zinc. forward. Now you're saying you're not interested, so what would you want okay, to do? Okay, no, so I'm, I'm merely saying that those, I just read those two papers in The Lancet, brilliant, very nice, beautiful modeling, love it. But the issue was based on the premise that in 2050, people in India would be consuming lentils and legumes and grains. I don't think so. 
the nutrition transition in Asia and Southeast Asia has been extremely rapid. And the consumption, for example, of rice in Vietnam is plunging. With support of the government, which does not really want people to eat a diet of rice and green, leafy greens, because of very low calcium intake leading to stunting, they would much rather to increase the consumption of dairy products. So there are also public health and governmental measures con you know, contributing to this. So what I'm saying about worrying about what will happen to zinc in lentils in India in 2050, I'm saying there are more pressing problems such as will there be any groundwater in India in 2050 for any kind of crop, let alone lentils with zinc. There are many other pressing problems that push this very interesting modeling of zinc somewhat to the background, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Let's move on. There's two more questions, and we're about out of time. Cynthia. I want to ask you a question I have asked John before, but actually two, all three, it's about scale. And John, in your presentation, you focus on the global scale trade policy models and the micro economic models, which are this often done at a household, but this household or you know, population of household levels. What about the national scale? And is this going to be a very, a lot of the de decisions, just as Adam was just saying, it's these are national decisions. Do, how can we take this national scale into account? Do we need to? And how can we possibly do it? Because it seems to be missing. And then just on the crop side as well, we can, we can do fields. Uh, Europeans have had a, so much experience in um, doing assessments uh, for the nations and all of Europe. But is this really also what we're going to need to really, really work on getting national scale assessments in what we do? So one answer, I guess, would be that there are national models, of course, and, and have been done for a number of countries. Uh, IFPRI has applied some of their CG models to a number of different countries. So, so that does exist, of course. Uh, increasingly, the global models could be thought of as a, a set of national models interacting with each other to some degree, I suppose you could say. So I think progressively we're going to bridge th that gap uh, that way. Um, yeah, just one little anecdote. Years ago, when I was visiting, chatting with Tom Hurdle uh, about this, I said, oh, you know, it seems like we need global, national, subnational. And he, his comment was, nah, forget the national. Why? <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of for, for that reason that I, I think he, he, he's, he, he didn't really see a distinct role for those national models if you have a well-done global model, I guess. But, um, you know, whereas if you really want this more disaggregate information for things like, you know, the distributional impacts, uh, nutritional, that sort of thing, you really need the more disaggregate And the, so much of the decision making. I, I don't know, you know, uh, it's, it's linking. Now I flipped a few yeah, switches uh, over here in the corner. Yeah, but yeah. make it quick because we're running well, out of time. I would disagree with Tom. Okay. I think the main role is heterogeneity. Right. To, to, to deal with household level uh, income distribution and things like that, you can't do that in the global model. You have to do that. Well, also, well also, but most national models don't do it either. This whole right? issue of water, at the global level, you have to be very, very summary. At the national level, you can be a lot more detailed. You can never stick in the global model. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely necessary. Okay. Yeah. I'm, good. I'm going to call on Jess just as a, for a quick uh, comment. I just wanted to come back to your comment about the food element and you know, what nutrition um, would be required. And this is sort of a, a call to all of you that are looking at climate models is that food is dietary diversity and dietary quality is essential for improving nutritional status. But it's not the only thing. Mm -hmm. To really reduce stunting or <coughs> impact obesity it requires a lot of different sectors. If we just look at sanitation and hygiene, huge implications on undernutrition. So while I know it's, we're focusing on agriculture, but from a climate perspective, I think we all need to think about that. If you just took food and fortified it with every nutrient, you're still not going to address the stunting burden. You have to address sanitation and hygiene, women's empowerment, income, it's all of these other sectors, and that's what makes nutrition so complicated. It's a, a wicked problem. Um, so, I mean, I think the goal
for most of the nutrition community is to ensure that people have access, they can afford a diverse, high quality diet with a mixture of fresh, animal source foods, fortified foods. But that's not the only piece, right? So Jim's heard me say it. In nutrition, we talk about from farm to flush. It's not just what gets to the fore. It's moving beyond that. So you have to have a healthy immune system, functional health system, good sanitation, good hygiene. You have to start thinking about malaria burden with climate. All of these kind of other water factors. So I just, I just want us to be cognizant that if achieving food security is one element of achieving nutrition security, but it's not enough. I'm going to ask Alex to make a last question, and then John Francois has something. Yeah, maybe I'll change it from a question to a comment, because I know it's late, and a lot of the people from overseas will maybe up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, I just wanted to say quickly, you know, this, this talk about shocks, I want to make sure we recognize the difference between what we all think needs to be done and kind of how we might get there. So just as an analogy, in the CMIP climate modeling community, uh, it took them really until about CMIP 5 to do a decadal prediction set of runs, which is the closest analogy I can think of to actually understanding how these things work. And even then, the results were mixed, and they think now with CMIP 6 they're going to be that much further. So I think this is crucial to get on the table, um, and something that we should build the framework towards eventually having. But some of these long-term development comments we've had um, might need a long-term research. Very, very good comment. Jean-Francois. Yeah, thank you. I think it's uh, very much in line with, with what uh, Alex said. Uh, to me, what would be really important for the future, but I, I admit it's more or less for the long-term future, would be uh, to go uh, in the same direction as the climate uh, modeling community has, uh, which is that uh, initially uh, we had just uh, the projections according to different emission levels, but then we had climate stabilization scenarios. And could we create anything that would be like, uh, you know, risk mitigation scenario for agriculture? Uh, how can we create uh, increased resilience? You may ask the question in an inverse way compared to what we have been doing so far. Mm -hmm. You may ask the question about what is the desirable state of agricultural systems and food systems in the 2050s, mm -hmm. and how do we get there? And if you address mm -hmm. it in this way, the modeling tools need to be a bit refrained and I, I think that beyond what is currently uh, ongoing in ACMIP, which will lead to some integrated assessment, uh, we would need to start really thinking on how can we get to some of the desirable properties of the global food systems mm -hmm. by 2050, and what would be required. And this would uh, help uh, maybe creating some slightly novel directions. Mm -hmm. yes. Very, very good point. Jim, I, I really oh. <laughs> have to add to this is the fact that the analogy between agriculture and the climate system is a bit misleading because the agriculture system is unique that is um, basically vulnerable both to the climate and the weather. So therefore you have these two time scales that affect uh, agricultural system. Therefore the task ahead for us is to factor both of those. If we are going to address the concerns of not only the climate community, but the whole yeah, stuff, stakeholder. yeah. stakeholders mm -hmm. that you are listing there. So I think there is a difference here. I, I'm not suggesting that we should go all the way, but we have to recognize that if our research is going to uh, be targeted towards non-climate interest community, i.e. the uh, the sustainability com uh, community, mm -hmm. the agricultural system, and so on and so forth, we have no choice but to consider these shorter time scales, be it sub-seasonal or decadal time scales, and therefore the type of research that we need to do is, 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 is a bit different than the climate community. Having, having worked in that community, yeah. Yeah. It just, I, I recognize a distinct difference here. These are very good comments. In fact, I think what Jafra was suggesting, we could, we could identify maybe some 2050 scenarios that would have this ideal right. that would deal with weather and climate, right. for example. So the, anyway, these are really good ideas, uh, really good discussion. It's great to have such an exciting panel here, so I'd like to give them another hand.